Hello, my name is Nicola Hunt, and I'm currently a lecturer in the Literatures and English Discipline, which is part of the Department of Language, Linguistics and Literature at the Cave Hill campus of the University of the West Indies. Today, I am moderating a conversation among writers out of the Caribbean, specifically the winners of the inaugural short story competition hosted by Caribbean Magazine Plus. The competition was open to entries from across the multilingual diversity of the Caribbean and saw entrants from Belize, Jamaica, Trinidad, Montserrat, Dominica, and Puerto Rico, to name a few. At the award ceremony in April, Mr. Yuri Kemp, editor of the magazine, made two telling observations about the vision behind the competition. Firstly, it is to provide an opportunity for new or emerging writers from the region. Secondly, it's to spotlight the diversity of the Caribbean, especially its many voices speaking in several languages. It is encouraging that in its first outing, the competition has realized that vision with its many entrants, as well as with its winners. In the first instance, it has not only highlighted new writers as in early career writers, but also writers established in their own backyard, but perhaps new to a wider regional readership. In the second instance, the narrative voices of the stories covered Creoles, Spanish, and Papiamento, which delightfully reaffirmed the heterogeneity of this region. This short story competition is a welcome addition to the various fora for creative writing, increasing the possibilities for additional voices, for greater contributions to experimental and established genres, for expanding access to Caribbean writers, as well as stories. So I think the tenor of today's conversation should be around the craft of writing and its possibilities. Its possibilities for those who are dedicated to writing, for readers, and for our understanding and expectations of literature about and from the Caribbean. To begin the conversation, I would like to invite each of today's guests to introduce themselves. So to share a little about where they're from, their writing background, and perhaps provide a brief summary of their winning story. And I'd like to have the order of the introductions go from Sue to then Lafleur and finally Brandon. So Sue, I turn it over to you. Share a little bit about yourself and your writing background and something about your story. Well, hello everyone. My name is Sue McRae. I write under the pseudonym S.L. Shepherd, mainly because I started writing before I got married, so it was too much trouble to change it. I write short stories, novels, and plays. I am from the Bahamas, and despite what you hear, we do have a strong tradition of writing. We also have a strong tradition of storytelling. And I think we want to make sure that this tradition is heard throughout the Caribbean, that Bahamian voices are heard throughout the Caribbean. I have written numerous plays which have been performed in the Bahamas and have won awards in the Bahamas, and two novels, and um, Short stories, well, I think short stories you go to whenever you need something to do that you don't, you can't work on that novel, you, you need to write and you write a short story. And I always find short stories the more difficult to write because you have to condense your thoughts. You have to find the right words. I think a short story is as difficult to write as poetry. It's, it's so important that you, get to the point of the story without being obvious. I enjoy writing. I enjoy sharing my writing. And I am very pleased to have been involved with the Caribbean writers and to find other people that I can read. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sue. I'll give you an opportunity after Lafleur gives her introductions and Brandon his to kind of give us a little bit of detail, summary, sorry, about your short story. So right. I'll turn it over to, to Lafleur now. Well, hello all, I'm Lafleur Coburn. I am from the beautiful Monty Island state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm currently living in Barbados where I am immersed in um, the literary world of, of Barbados. It's, it's, it's very vibrant. Um, they have literature festival. They're seeking to have their, their pieces in schools, in the school curriculum syllabus and so forth. And what that has done for me is highlighted how deficient the literary tradition in St. Vincent is. And so I am on a quest of sorts to have Vincentian writing included in the regional canon, um, to, to, to have Vincentian literature visible in the regional tradition, uh, literary landscape. And so I have been, you know, getting my writing out there. I, I have a writing group, the nucleus, a group of Vincentian women writers who span the diaspora. We're in the US, we're in Canada, we're in uh, England, and also at home in St. Vincent and, and uh, some other Caribbean countries. And we, I, have, I have also linked with uh, writers in the diaspora. So things are, are, you know, slowly but surely happening. My quest really is to, as I said, have Vincentian writing in the limelight, have it introduced to the rest of the world, to the local people home in, in, in terms of curriculum in schools, um, wherever. We just want uh, Vincentians in the desperate and at home and the world to know that we're out here as well, we're writing. In terms of my story, you remain, it's, it's about um, mother-daughter relationship um, and great loss and how great loss can cause an individual to create their own reality and how you know others react to this reality basically mental health and how caribbean communities uh see it view it um and how we can approach destigmatizing um how we as a society view this type of um not mental health but mental illness but how we view mental health and mental illness. illness. Um, so that's it for me, really. Thank you. So we move on to Brandon. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Brandon Boulos from Aruba. And um, I just started writing about two years ago, I'd say. Um, I, I had just happened upon a great love for reading. Um, I don't really know where it came from because when I was younger, I, I absolutely hated reading. But I think uh, what happened, and this speaks to an important cornerstone of, of my writing, is that on Aruba, uh, even though we're a Caribbean island, we're very much Americanized because of uh, our dependency on the tourism industry. And um, this has caused that in, in the beginning, uh, I would read, American stories, and I didn't, I didn't relate to them. You know, I didn't like them so much. And then when I was older, I would come across these uh, really unknown Aruban writers, because we we only have a handful of uh, writers here on Aruba. Our, our language is, it can be limiting, but um, our writers here uh, really test the limits, and they do some impressive stuff uh, with our our still developing language. And there, I, I gained an appreciation for what our language is able to do and the impact it had on me personally to, to look at the Aruban spirit and kind of look around and, and say, you know, we're, we're kind of losing that or, or I would like to help maintain that. And, um, you know, that, and I think that leads very nicely to my story, Barracuda, where it's about this young Dutch girl who was raised on Aruba. And there are 
uh, behind the scene workings happening around her, hidden, hidden in nature, hidden in, in the abstract concept of time. And the narrator watches uh, these things that she is completely oblivious to kind of happening in the background throughout the story. So yeah, that's basically me. Thank, Thank you. you. So now I, I turn back to Sue so that she can give a summary of, of her story. Thank you. Well, my story is called Watching the Waves and its protagonist is a young girl. And what I wanted to show was how evil can exist in a very ordinary situation and how children cope with things that they don't know that this is unusual, but they just cope with it and they find their own ways of coping. And I wanted to show how children can do that. And I wanted to, to show the way families work, some families. So this story shows all of that as we follow this little girl on her journey. So I have um, a few general questions about three, which I'd like each of you to answer in your own turn. And the first one has to do with a question that was once posed to Juno Diaz, who is also a pretty well-known Caribbean diaspora writer. And that question is, what goals do you set for yourself when you sit down to write a story? And so I'd like to hear what your thoughts are to that question before I share with you what Juno Diaz responded. So Sue, do you, you want, want to take that one first? Do you want me to start? Yeah. It's very strange when you say a goal, because when I, when I think goal, I think, oh, is there supposed to be a message? But usually I just want to tell a story that shows the character and the personality of the people that are in my mind. Um, I don't think that I have a goal as such, except that it should be readable and it should, um, it should touch people in some sort of way. I like that answer. Lafleur, do you wanna take this one next? <laughs> I've muted myself. When I'm writing, my goal really is to seek catharsis. As an empath, I'm always venting on the page. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really, you know, I don't sit down to write to reach anyone. Usually it's just very selfish, just, just to get the words out and to vent. Mm -hmm. So I hit the page and the rest of the world remain safe. What about you, Brandon? Well, with me, it's pretty simple. I have three goals. I just want to express my art honestly. So express myself and my art honestly when I write. Um, I want my work to be accessible. And the final and most important one is I just, I want to entertain other people. It's very important to me. I really like these answers. So I'll share with you what um, Diaz replied. He said, you can't just get a nice little tale. So I sit down to open people to discussion and criticism. Mm -hmm. So for him, it says opening up is making people uncomfortable. It's his goal when he sits down to write. Um, so my second question, which is to everyone is, um, what do you most want to learn? about your craft? What do you most want to learn about writing? So what I want to do is go in the opposite direction and go mm. Brandon, then Lafleur, and then Sue. Okay, well, in terms of my writing, what I most want to uh, learn and, and excel at is beauty. I think beautiful writing can teach a person to, um, to love life more. I mean, that happened to me, right? I came across really beautiful prose and that, that really heightened um, my sense of appreciation for um, really monotonous things, you know, um, how beautiful my yard is or you know, simple things like that. And I, I strive for that kind of prose. 
So Lafleur, what about you? Um, I think I most want to figure out how I affect others. Like, what do you see when you read what I put on the page? I would, I would love to be a fly on the wall when people read my work or, or discuss it. And I want to know, do you feel my frustration? Is there any awareness going on? Um, I, I just want to see how others react to it. I think that's a very brave position because you know <laughs> you might not always like what you write. <laughs> True. That's a very brave position to take. Okay, I turn it over to Sue now. What do you most want to learn about writing? I think I'm trying to learn about the human psyche. I I write. And a lot of times what I expected to write is not what I actually write. And maybe because as writers, we look, we watch, we listen. Um, things that might have been buried within me come out when I write. So I learn more about the human psyche that I didn't know I had in me, but I have been watching and I have been listening. So those things come out. Okay. I like that answer. So my third question, and it might seem like a really strange question, but I, this comes out of my experience as a lecturer and, you know, teaching students about creative writing as well as how to analyze writing. And so my last question, general question that I throw to everyone is, what is the value of editing to your writing process? How much do you value editing when you are writing? So I'm going to start with Lafleur and then go to Brandon and once again end with Sue. So Lafleur, you're nodding. So I'm thinking you have a lot to say about that. <laughs> um, editing for me is twofold. It's it's about polishing and, and having um, well, you can never have the perfect piece as a writer because every time you go back there's something new you want to change this you want to shift that but really it's about polishing your work and, and having it as clear uh, as possible for the reader mm -hmm. um, sometimes when I go back to some work that I have sent out and I find um, errors and so forth I, I want to you know berate myself but it's already out and like I said sometimes every time you go back to a piece there is something new and so that's why i say it's twofold for me i would like to polish the work i would like to make it as perfect as possible but sometimes i just want to push it away from me because it the, the characters bothers you you want to sleep you wake up and there's something to add and and sometimes you just want to get get them away from your 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 subconscious so it's twofold for me it's good and bad Okay. I think I said I throw it out to Brandon next. Brandon, how important is editing? How much do you value editing in your writing process? For me, I greatly value um, editing. I, I see the entire process as um, one half is writing and the other half is editing. So just about as much time as I've spent writing, I will spend um, rewriting or editing or proofreading. And um, for, it's because I have a very like, uh, automatic approach to writing like I don't I don't sit at the computer with a clear plan in mind I sit there and then it all just starts coming out and you know I'll write like 10 pages like that but then I have to spend the next three days editing those <laughs> pages because it's just a bunch of crazy thoughts right yeah. and um and I think it's very important because um another benefit is that it makes it look like you know what you were doing the whole time so I, th I think it's a great benefit to my writing and I value it a lot. Sue, what about you? I think editing can be tedious, but it's also exhilarating because you know, you know in your heart when you've done something that is just right. And then you go back four days later and you read it and you go, what in the world was I thinking? And then you start again, you change words. And I love, we all love words. I love words and finding the perfect word when you edit, that, that's exhilarating. So I edit a lot. And as Brandon said, it's just as important as writing, the editing of the piece. 
I'm really glad to hear you say that because like I said, it comes out of my own experience dealing with students who, whose approach to creative writing generally tends to be whatever first comes out is perfect. <laughs> There's no editing is just something somebody in an obscure office does <laughs> when I send the work to them. And I think, no, editing is actually part of the creative process. So I'm very glad that all three of you shared those experiences here. So I think that um, now is really a good time to hear a little bit from each of your stories. And the way that I was thinking about it was I wanted to pick out an excerpt because I read all of these stories and I wanted to highlight a particular feature um, in what you wrote. So what I'd like to do is have each of you read a little bit of that excerpt and talk about um, like the rationale behind some of your creative choices. So I don't know if Sue, if you're ready to start. I, there was a, a selection I, I pulled out of your story. <laughs> I don't know if you see it. <clears throat> so you could read that for us. And then I wanna ask you one or two questions about your creative choices there. Okay. Marissa detoured from the dining room and turned in on the television. The news had already started. It was all about the hurricane. It was as if nothing else was happening in the world. The hurricane was now a category five and headed directly for them. It was coming up the south side. They lived on the south side. The meteorologist was talking about storm surge now. 10 to 12 feet, he said. The storm was strengthening. People were being urged to evacuate. Marissa tried not to listen. This hurricane sounded like a monster and she believed in monsters. In one of her lives, she had lived in a monster-infested valley. They were huge and hairy and had talons instead of fingernails. They came to get little children on nights when there was no moon. As she watched all of the children around her being taken, Marissa planned her escape. Using magic, she dug a tunnel to the sea. She reached the shore and saw the waves dancing and leaping in their frills of white. Then she looked back and realized that the valley had disappeared. She was free. Marissa checked all of the lamps by turning them on. She was going to choose the brightest for herself. The door behind her slammed and she jumped. It was her father. Hey, Marissa. Hey, Dad. She reached up and kissed him. He liked to be greeted with a kiss. She did not have far to reach. Her father was average height, as it was calculated in the mid 20th century. All of his sons were now taller than him. He pushed her away impatiently. Why are all the lamps on? Mom said to check them. All of them, all at once? Marissa stepped back quietly, quickly. She was very attuned to her father's moods and heard from his voice that he was extremely annoyed. No, I was just, just what? He said, swatting her to the ground as she, if she was a fly. Marissa curled up and lay very still. She was quiet. Sometimes this worked. This was not one of those times. He leaned over her and repeated, I asked you just what? Answer me, girl. She had to answer now or it would be worse. She kept her eyes closed. I wanted to see which one was the brightest. Her dad chuckled. It was a good sign. Still afraid of the dark, Marissa? Yes. He chuckled again. She was safe. Ass, he said, as he kicked her, then walked away, still laughing. Thank you, Sue. And so <laughs> I have two related questions. The first is, why did you choose to tell this story from a child's point of view? And the second related part of that question is, how do you think this perspective influences the emotional dynamic between Marissa and her father in this excerpt? Um, I chose to tell it from the child's point of view because I, I wanted I wanted it to be simple, but I wanted everyone to see what children go through. Mm 
And when you tell it from the psychiatrist or the mother or the father, you don't understand what the child is going through. Like when she goes into her little dream worlds, the mother and father would not know that. You had to be in her mind to go through that, go into that dream world. And I think we also, because of that, we could see her father from her point of view. We're not seeing him as a man. We're seeing him as dad who will slap you and kick you. So we, we get that point of view too. Thank you. I want to now move on to Lafleur story. I don't know if Lafleur has her excerpt ready. Do you? Yes, I do. Okay. So I just want to do the same thing. I'm going to let you read your excerpt, and I'm going to just ask you uh, maybe one or two questions about your choices for that selection. Okay. So here goes. Angels form donor Rick show up at the hospital when she about three weeks. I don't waste time on he. I write here to life after he slip abortion pills in my drink the day he find out about the pregnancy. Rick walls in me ward, wringing his hands like the night mommy discovered the pill at the bottom of the glass and chase him out of the house. Mommy used to warn me about his boy man behavior. He twice my age, but mommy swear he only have a fourth of my mental maturity. Boy, men like Rick attracted to fatherless girls like grasshoppers to a lone tree. They will nyam off every bush in sight and then move on to the next street of a care in the world. Mommy have a proverb for every situation. Rick exceed mommy suspicious, suspicions. He worse than grasshopper. He is a whole swarm of locusts. That worthless vagabond never give a rat's ass about his child. He come about, he come chat about Casita, me real sorry about the accident. I tell him, Rick, accidents happen every day. Mommy good, we baby good. He never allowed me to finish. He in the people hospital wailing like he dotish and screaming for the doctors to tell the truth. I asked myself what I see in him in the first place. And when I couldn't come up with a proper answer, I make a decision to ignore Rick for good. I too wait to move about in the hospital. My body feel as if somebody beat me with old iron. I visited my child in the primary ward when everybody else gone to sleep. Mommy grinning at me proudly and telling me to take it easy. We never get to India on the beach for the maternity shoot, but I thankful all the same. I still here with me two favorite people. When mommy smile, I start bawling and me not sure why. She always escort me back to my bed and grip me hands tight, tight till me fall asleep. Sometimes me get so emotional, me swear daddy does be there with she. Three weeks later, mommy tell me angel ready for discharge, but the doctors monitored me for a few more days. I don't argue because I feel tired for no reason most of the time. If they can help me get past that, I go be grateful. Regretfully, I overhear some nurses whispering about moving me to secure facilities in Glen. And I find the strength to leave with Angel in the dead of night. Just imagine I now have a young baby and these heartless people plotting to make me miserable. The last time I checked, the area they mumbling about have a college, a geriatric sanatorium, and a psychiatric hospital. I graduated from college a long time, no part of me geriatric, and me certainly not crazy. So why are they talking about sending me there? The funky hospital match is lumpy, lumpy like it's stuck with old class. I only tolerate staying there because I want to be in the best health for my child. I head home to my own bed with mommy pushing Angel in the pram she by ever since my belly starts showing. When I reach home, mommy sent everywhere. I'm not sure why that is the only thing that registered in my tired mind. Get your rest. I got deal with Angel, she instructed me. She don't have to tell me twice. I pass out before she, my head hit the pillow. The next morning, mommy not at home, but the house echoing with she rocks market woman laugh and she dry jokes. I picture she smile and me chest like it was explode cause me miss her. Me had to laugh to myself cause she probably just step out to the usual grocery shopping. The house feel like one big graveyard except for the sound of Angel goggling. I smile. Mommy don't bathe she grandchild and have she well dressed up and playing in she pram. Your granny don't play when it come to the tour with child, I tell Angel, and laugh when she start goggling even louder. Thank you, LeFleur. 
So I was thinking about the voice in that story and I wanted to ask how much of the voice was determined by how you saw your character and how much of it is influenced by your experience as a Caribbean citizen? Okay, um, a, lot of it, a lot of it is based on how the character came to me. She's obviously Vincentian. So I wanted the voice to be um, authentically Vincentian, Vinci with the, the Creole and everything, if there's such a thing as authentic Vincentian. And I wanted her to be unapologetically herself. So I had to use that sort of uh, mix, no, I straight away from the standard form so that she can remain, you know, genuine to who, how I saw her. Did I answer both questions or? Yes, please, you did. Okay, okay. <laughs> So now I move to Brandon's excerpt. Uh, just checking in if you have it ready. Yes. Um, you'd like me to read from pages five to seven? Yeah. There's okay. a particular section there on page five where it, where it begins, this had been her favorite beach. Mm -hmm. Right. Until that end where it says she's alone. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to done. Okay. This had been her favorite beach since she was little. It pleased her to see its shabby parking lot made up of brown trodden sand with deep undulating holes from the large clumps of prickly pear cactuses to the swarms of dragonflies floating above them like black clouds, to the short sun-baked craggy coquina cliffs that descended from two sides converging into a humble shoreline below, which is what the people of Aruba called Boca Catali. All these things came together to make her haven, where she could be content in her solitude. Michelle loved going to the beach on a weekday, where the crowds of rowdy tourists on their UTVs were nowhere to be seen. When she arrived, she looked inside the wooden box where people left and took used books. It stood under the pallid quihi trees just before the beach. She grabbed the first title she liked and began scanning the area for her favorite palapa. Seeing, it as, seeing as it was free, she quickly ran towards it, fighting against the rough dirt and stone and plopped a beach chair under it, claiming it for herself. She sat down and thought to herself that it felt pretty good to be alone when suddenly a memory of Marcel flashed into her mind. Ah, what do I do? She thought to herself. She scanned the area, taking in her surroundings as if to distract herself from the question. The waves crashed gently against the rocks it was her and a tourist family that were sitting near the shore, listening to country music on a speaker. The mother of the family was sleeping spread eagle with an open, open book atop her breast, and the father was looking off into the distant horizon, drinking cold beer from a can of coarse light. Further ahead, Michelle could hear the splashing of water and squealing of children below the rocky cliffs from where she sat. She figured that that was the sound of the couple's children already busy playing in the water. She couldn't help but think of this scene as her future with Marcel. She began to focus on the father, who seemed to be intently searching for something in that empty horizon in front of him, as if there was something that nobody else could see. But what was it, she wondered. She found herself identifying with the man. She could see herself in the same situation 10 years from now, concerned with the things most distant and disconnected from her. Michelle shook off her daydreaming and stood up to take her shirt and shorts off, revealing a red bikini. She turned to look at the two tourists again. The woman was still asleep and the man with a face that gave her chills, still gazing into the endless distance. Now she too found herself looking at it, trying to find that thing they were looking for. It's beautiful, isn't it? The tourist said to her. Surprised, Rochelle paused a moment before she realized she was meant to say something in return. Oh, yeah, I love the silence, she said finally, as if to tell the man that she wanted to be alone, but the guy didn't seem bothered by it. Yeah, he said almost in a whisper, the silence. Turning his head back to the tropical expanse in front of him, to her, he seemed the loneliest man she had ever laid eyes on. She felt sorry for him, though she couldn't explain why. Michelle returned her gaze to the beautiful view ahead, Everything had a strange quality to it on a quiet day like today, as if this wasn't reality. 
A little further, further down to her right, out on the ocean blue, there was a single medium-sized boat swaying silently. Closer by, over the tiny cliff in front of her, seawater rocked with an emerald luster, growing darker the further it got away. Sorry, growing darker the further away it got. A deep blue at that point hid from her eyes what lurked below. The sun hung high in the sky, pouring its rays onto the ocean surface. Rochella watched the reflecting light in the water flicker magically, like tiny sparkling stars that formed a reflected white bridge. 100,000 pearly white flashes exploding in and out of existence all at the same time, brought here by a blazing ball of fire 150 million kilometers away. It was so beautiful that she couldn't figure out why she had ever never noticed it before. She opened the book she had taken earlier and began perusing its contents, but not five minutes had passed before she closed it shut with a, with a hard thud. She couldn't focus. Her mind was filled with thoughts of Marcel, herself, and the ocean, that great big expanse seemingly never ending. Suddenly, Richella compared herself with that of the ocean. She felt tiny, alive and tiny. The sound of waves crashing sang her melancholy. The call of seagulls in the distance echoed across the open blue. She began to feel frighteningly alone. Thank you, Brandon. I want to draw attention to the, the detailed description of this story's physical environment and how you connect it to the, the central character. So my question is, can you explain for us how you were envisioning how these details can work to connect the reader to this character on an emotional level? So on an emotional level, uh, our character, Richella, is, as we see in snippets throughout the story, she's greatly concerned indirectly with the passage of time. And the nature around her um, and its striking beauty to the narrator it is meant to contrast how uh, nature um, deals with time and how Richella deals with time in that it, it frightens her and, and she suffers great anxiety over it. While uh, nature, the narrator represents this view of taking your time to see the beauty around you, right? The, the, the beautiful or my attempted beautiful descriptions of, of her surroundings. And uh, that's the contrast I wanted to draw to. And if you, if you read the story, you find out that uh, maybe time is coming after uh, Rochella in a way because of the way she thinks. Okay, so I have one final general question to kind of wrap up our session because I'm still keeping an eye on the time. And it's directed to one of the main themes of this year's Caribbean Literary Conference, which is exploring the connections and possibilities in Caribbean writing. So my question is, what are your general impressions about the future of Caribbean writing? And then in particular, what do you see may be the most useful in celebrating the connections across Caribbean literature? So I think I'm gonna turn that one over to Sue to kind of lead how we end off today's session. What are your general impressions about the future of Caribbean writing? I think Caribbean writing is coming into its own. And I think that is because more people want to know more about other people as the world gets smaller in that strange way. So they want to know about us. Um, I think that we are finding out, and maybe rather slowly, that there are other stories to tell. There are other stories that we need to know. And that's why we are going to, Caribbean writing is probably going to explode because we want to know the other stories. Um, and your second question was? The, the, the second half of that was, what do you think may be the most useful in celebrating the connections across Caribbean literature? Something like this, where we celebrate each other. If we celebrate each other, it's going to spread out. And we have to... We, we always talk about being together, but a lot of times we're just on our little islands by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that we celebrate each other from every island, not just the big islands, but every island. And that way we will 
to help it to grow. Okay. What about you, Lafleur? What are your okay. general impressions about the future of Caribbean writing? Future of Caribbean writing, I see. Um, it's, it's exciting because there's this general aura of inclusivity, meaning women mm -hmm. writers have been welcomed. They're blowing up even um, presently, Ingrid Passat, Cherry Jones, who, who was just uh, shortlisted for the Women Women's Prize. Yeah. Um, so I see uh, embracing of, of all uh, genres um, in terms of speculative fiction have you know, being given the focus where Caribbean folklore is being embraced as part of that, that spectrum. We have, as I said, women writers coming across, being embraced. So I think the, the future of Caribbean writing is, is looking good. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's an exci exciting time to be in right now in terms of how it is evolving. Right. And like I, and, that second part, what do you think is most useful in celebrating the connections across Caribbean literature. What is most useful, I think, mm -hmm. uh, the diffusion of that insular, insularity that used to, to, to dominate Caribbean literature, like each island would just have their own and, and you're not aware of what's going on the other island. I mm -hmm. think there's a sort of um, diffusion of that and we're celebrating, as Sue says, each other. We, we're there's there's a buildup of tolerance for our differences mm -hmm. and an embracing of our commonalities you know that that root structure that who who talked about it i forgot which one of the critics but it you know we may look separate on the surface but we're all connected under the sea you, you know that rise the repeating island the repeating yes, island concept yes, that, mm -hmm. that rise of concept and and that's that's also exciting to see we're celebrating each other. We, we are aware of each other. And like I said, it's, it's a good time to be involved in, in Caribbean literature. Okay, I'll turn it over to Brandon. And I'm, like I said, looking at the time. So I think we only have about three minutes <laughs> left. So Brandon, it's up to you now. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, I mean, first of all, I agree with basically everything everyone said. I'm super excited about uh, the future of Caribbean literature. I think that, um, you know, with, with the internet age, everybody is, is curious about um, everything now, and we have an interest uh, to connect to each other in, in different places. And I think Caribbean literature in particular has a lot of fun uh, and stories to tell. It, they can be very funny. Um, a favorite of mine is Sam Selvin. Some of his stories are exception, exceptionally hilarious. And so I think uh, we can all relate um, through a myriad of things um, in literary in Caribbean literature together. And um, what's the next question? Uh, how to support each other? I think that, you know, just be curious, uh, read more books, read Caribbean books, uh, talk about other Caribbean writers and, and support them because uh, we're all out here just trying to, um, you know, <laughs> I see I'm running out of time. It's okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Uh, so um, thank you all for your comments and your contributions. I really appreciate you being part of this conversation. And my concluding remarks look toward the relationship between new Caribbean writing, which could be seen as anything published in this century, and what we understand as mainstream or canonical Caribbean literature. And I do so with words borrowed from a writer who's also talking about a similar relationship in another part of the world. And he said, established writing works in a particular way. New writing will need to work differently, not only to distinguish them from older works, but so that they will speak to our time as freshly as those older stories spoke to theirs. I believe that the writers featured in today's discussion can help determine such relationship between established and new Caribbean literature. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. Thank you for Thank you. having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I think that's it.